So I wanted to take a quick survey of the room. How many folks in the room are game developers that work for a studio or a publisher? OK, awesome. How many folks are thinking about building their first game and need to know more about how to scale it up in the cloud? All right, great. And how many folks are just here because games are awesome? Yes. All right. Well, we're going to have a little bit of fun this afternoon. Uh, obviously, this is a great topic. Uh, and we've got some cool stuff to share with you. So we're going to be talking uh, a lot about game servers. But before we get into game servers, we're going to talk about Google Cloud's mission for games. So we're going to go a little broader about uh, what we're focusing on for bringing multiplayer games to life in the cloud. Then we'll get into game servers. What are they? And why do I need them for a game? What are the metrics that matter for running game servers well, particularly in the cloud? And then how do we scale game servers up for global audiences? How do we build really massive games with game servers? And then if you were at GDC, you might have noticed an interesting announcement we made there. We're going to talk a little bit about the future of gaming in the cloud at the end of this talk. So we're very passionate about games at Google. We have a lot of ways to work with, with game developers, with game players, and with creators. We're passionate about helping you create, connect, and scale your games in a lot of different ways across many different channels. Today, we're going to focus on two of those logos, the second and the third from the left. We're going to talk about Google Cloud for running your game servers and your back-end services. And we're also going to talk a little bit about Stadia. So Google Cloud's mission for games. So as it turns out, uh, building and scaling a global multiplayer game is, has quite a bit of complexity involved in it, right? And if there's two things that Google is really good at, it's scaling things up really big. We currently have eight services that have a billion users in them each daily. So Google really focuses on scaling. And we also focus on reducing complexity. The reason that services like Gmail and YouTube and Docs became so popular is because we were able to take the complexity out of using those services. So we want to bring that same sensibility to games. We want to scale games up really big, and we want to make it as easy as possible for you to do that. So we have four pillars that we believe will help us deliver on our mission. Number one, cross-platform. Cross-platform and cross-play have become really important concepts recently with games, right? Players want to be able to enjoy a game on a device of their choosing. Game servers are a critical component in delivering cross-platform and cross-play experiences. Google is a leader in open source. So with Kubernetes, we established a de facto open standard for interacting with infrastructure in the cloud. Kubernetes is your open source API to compute and storage running in any cloud or in your own data centers. We want to bring that same sensibility to games. So for any of the game services that we're building, we're going to go open source, because we believe you should be able to run them anywhere. This is in stark contrast to the gaming services that you might find in other clouds, which tend to be proprietary and involve a degree of lock-in. So Google also has a lot of expertise in machine learning and analytics. And we're very excited about bringing our capabilities to bear for games in this space as well. And then I think that first slide that we looked at does a really nice job of, of discussing that one Google story. We have a lot of different ways to help build and publish amazing games. And we're going to explore one Google a little bit more when we talk about GCP and Stadia later on. So what is our Cloud for Games team building? We're focusing on three different areas. First is game server hosting. We're focused on making our compute platform the best and most high performance place to run your games. This is going to be the focus of our talk today. But to run a large multiplayer game, you also need platform services. You need a place to run your APIs so that your users can log in and get assigned to a match. So we're doing work there. And we're also bringing the scale of our analytics and machine learning solutions to gaming as well. So we're going to focus mostly on game servers for today, but we're working in all three of those areas. 
So this is our reference architecture for games. So most games have a fairly similar flow when it's a, a multiplayer experience. So a gamer starts by logging into their profile, loading up their attributes, their skill level, other items that'll be used later on in their play experience. That's step one. That's a platform service API call. Step two, once I'm signed in, I need to find some friends to play a game with. That's called matchmaking. So I make a call to a matchmaker service. I get assigned to a match with a bunch of my friends. And next up, we need to play a game. We need to get assigned into a match. So the third step in the process is that this group of people who've been assigned together into a match get assigned to a game server. And then finally, as we're interacting together uh, in that game, lots of interesting events are being generated. So we want to capture those events in a data warehouse so that you can analyze what your players are doing, think about how to improve the customer experience, and how to monetize your game most effectively. Okay? So in today's talk, we're going to focus mostly on this part of the equation, the game servers. So let's start by defining what game servers are so that we have a common language for discussion. So what are game servers, and why do I need them for my multiplayer game? So we'll start with sort of the definition, and then we'll dig in a little bit deeper. But a game server is the authoritative source of events for your game. A game server broadcasts that state to all of the clients so that they can visualize an accurate representation of what that player should be seeing. The game server also captures and processes all of the inputs from your player. And the game server needs to do this on a very consistent and timely manner in order to provide a smooth and fluid experience to your players. So let's use an example, one of my favorite games, Apex Legends. Who loves Apex Legends? Awesome. Let's use Apex Legends as an example. So to understand what a game server does, we need to also understand what a game client does and how the client and the server interact with one another. So on the left-hand side, you can see a, a, a picture of what a game client does. A game client, so let, let's take a, a match of Apex Legends, 60 players, battle royale format, right? You have 60 game clients, one for each player. They're going to be running on a PC or a console, or for some games, they might be running on a mobile device. The responsibility of a game client is to render the graphical experience that that player is experiencing. Graphics, sound, and input are the primary responsibilities of the client. Because this is a graphically intensive workload, this is where your GPU comes into play. So a game client is heavily reliant on a GPU to get his job done. So if graphics are what a game client focuses on, and for, if it's for one player, then what does a game server do? Well, a game server is running in a data center on a host or a virtual machine. That's the first difference. All of the players that got assigned into that match, all 60 players, their game clients are going to connect to that game server. The game server, contrary to what you might believe, doesn't process graphics at all. The game server is responsible for the state of that game world. And because the game server is dealing with data rather than graphics, this is a CPU-intensive process. You don't typically have a GPU involved in a game server at all. So an analogy that I like to use is a game server you know, for this island that 60 players are dropping onto, the, the game server is sort of penciling in the details of that world and drawing out a blueprint. And then that blueprint is sent out to the game clients where a high fidelity graphic representation of what that player sees is rendered based on that blueprint that's generated by the server. So let's talk a little bit more specifically about what game servers do. Game servers have to receive the input from the players. Based on that input, game servers are going to track the positions of those players on the map. Those game players are going to interact with obstacles. They're going to run into buildings. They might even run into each other. The game server is going to process what's happening when those objects collide. 
We have physics like gravity. In combat games, you're going to have particles flying around. So the game server is calculating velocities and hits or misses. And so once all those calculations are performed, the game server is broadcasting the results back out to those game clients so that they can render the results. And this has to happen very consistently, up to 120 times a second in very high fidelity games. So let's go back to our example of Apex Legends, and let's talk through what's actually happening as we're playing through that game of Apex. So these Battle Royale games all start in about the same way. You've got a big island, an airship passes over the island, and those 60 players begin to skydive one by one onto that island, falling at terminal velocity, 160 miles an hour, to their preferred destinations on that map. The game server is calculating the positions of all those players as they're falling to the ground. Now, those players are adjusting their body position, which changes wind resistance, velocity, trajectory, acceleration. All of these things are being recalculated in real time by that game server. So next, those players land on the island. They begin picking up loot. They begin picking up items, weapons, preparing for the battle ahead. The game server is keeping track of each player's inventory and the position of objects on the island. Players start going upstairs, entering buildings, running into walls. Now we're doing collision detection. And once all the players have equipped themselves sufficiently, the combat begins. Projectiles start flying around. Hits and misses are calculated. If we have explosive projectiles, we have particles that are being generated. All of this is being calculated by the game server. And at the beginning of the match, we start with 60 players. And as the match goes on, we get down to one player, the ultimate victor in the game, right? And so what you might realize is at the beginning of the match, there's a whole lot of work that that game server has to do to calculate all 60 players' inputs and uh, positions. At the end of the game, there's a lot less work to do. But regardless of sort of that changing workload, the game server has to maintain a constant tick rate throughout the match. So you might say, OK, uh, you know, I, I've been playing multiplayer games for a while. Uh, what do we need game servers for? We used to have this thing called peer-to-peer. -peer. And in a peer-to-peer -peer model, you've got, let's say we've got a few PCs that have been assigned to a match together. And we sort of elect one of them to also take on the role of the game server. So that PC will become not only the game client, but also the game server. Well, so there are a few problems with this approach. Number one, your, game, your PCs are located on a home network, and there's lots of variables out in that environment. How do we pick which one of these PCs should become the server? Should we pick the highest clock speed? Should we pick the lowest latency or the best bandwidth? Let's say that we go with the best network connection. Now, after the match starts, let's say someone else in that house starts streaming a 4K video. Or let's say that someone in that house starts downloading a huge file on a peer-to-peer -peer network. All of a sudden, the network characteristics of that PC have fundamentally changed. Let's talk about scale. Today's Battle Royale games have 50, 60, 100 players. A few network connections into a consumer network, that scales just fine. Let's try 100 connections into a PC on a home network. It doesn't scale. And finally, and the probably the most significant issue is that, remember we said that server needs to be authoritative, right? So if that binary is deployed onto someone's PC, they can hack that binary. They can mess with the authoritative nature of that game server. All of the traffic from all of those players is coming into that person's home network. They can interfere with that traffic to change the balance of the game in their own favor. So peer-to-peer -peer was great when we got started, but for the types of high-fidelity experiences people want today, we've outgrown peer-to-peer. -peer. So how are dedicated servers different? We've got one additional component that we bring into play, which is that we, make, we deploy that game server into a virtual machine in a professional data center. What does this do for us? It brings us additional consistency. Now my network is being managed by professionals. It's being monitored by SREs. I don't have the kinds of issues that I have on a home network. 
I have high-speed network interconnects on these virtual machines, so I can scale up to more connections per game server. And most important of all, that binary is firewalled. In a professional environment, it's much harder to interfere with that binary and with the network traffic going into that data center. So now we're ready for a world-class multiplayer experience. OK, so we understand what game servers are and why we need them to deliver world-class experiences. What matters for game servers? We need to understand this to be able to deliver the type of services that high-fidelity games demand. Performance matters. And there's two key metrics for a game server. The first is latency. This is a network metric. So if we have game clients that are communicating multiple times per second with that server and need to receive replies back multiple times per second, we need the lowest possible network latency between those clients and that server. So that's our network benchmark. And then if we're running on our game server in a tight loop, that's processing all of those events that I told you about for up to 100 players in a match, our CPU needs to be able to process that loop consistently. So we call that frame time. So that's our CPU performance metric. We're going to dig into both of these a little bit more, because these are really important. So let's talk latency. What kind of latency do we need for a real-time game? Generally speaking, for a real-time game like an Apex Legends, you're going to want about 25 milliseconds round trip time to your clients or less. That's preferred. Some games, you might be able to get away with higher latency, 50 milliseconds, maybe 100 milliseconds. It's going to depend on the game. But for the types of games we're talking about, 25 milliseconds or less is preferred. So let's look at a map of the United States. Let's say that we're running our game server on one coast, and we're running a client on another coast. You got at least 50 milliseconds, typically, between those two endpoints. So we've already doubled our latency goal. That's not going to work. Well, if I'm looking at these, uh, this map and I'm familiar with GCP, I might say, you know, those little blue flags, those are Google data centers. I'm going to be clever, and I'm going to put all my game servers in that one right in the middle. Well, networks are funny things. You might expect the latency to cut in half, but it's not always a, a function just of distance. It can be carrier-based, uh, carrier and there can, be other, uh, there can be other concerns like the number of hops between uh, the two endpoints. So deploying all of your game servers on a continental basis generally is not going to hit the mark. So you're typically going to end up with something that looks like this where you deploy collections of game servers to several different data centers, and then you assign players in a radius around those data centers to the closest possible deployment. There's a bit of an art to this, right? Because as you shrink those circles, you start decreasing the number of people that can play a game together. So if you shrink those circles too small, your matchmaking pool becomes too small, and people can't find other players to play with. But if it gets too big, your latency is too high. So there's a bit of an art to sort of balancing those two things. And sort of helping you figure out how to deploy your game servers based on your audience is something that we can help with. So that's latency. Now let's talk about our CPU benchmark, frame rates and budgets. Now again, imagine in a sort of a simplified model of a game server that you just have a while loop that's running. And all of those things that I told you about are sort of a line item in that while loop. You're going to want to go through that, each tick of that while loop in exactly the same amount of time every single frame. So we call that a tick rate. Sometimes it's also called a frame rate. And so for a Battle Royale game, a typical tick rate might be 20 to 30 ticks per second, 20 to 30 hertz. So that's exactly the frequency that you want to iterate through that loop. So if you have a tick rate of 20 hertz, you've got about 50 milliseconds to make it through a single pass of that game server's main loop. 50 milliseconds may sound like a lot of time, 
but let's take into consideration how many players we've got in that match. We have 60 players. So per player, I have less than one millisecond to get through that main loop. One to two milliseconds is a big deal on a game server. So there's not a lot of room for variance. And we'll talk more about variance in a little bit. So let's zoom in on what's happening during those frames. Okay? This is two frames being processed on a game server. We're going with that 20 hertz tick rate. We have 50 milliseconds to get through a single frame. In this example, we're actually able to get all of our work done in 40 milliseconds. That's great, we got done early. But remember, we have to wake up for the next frame right on the boundary of 50 milliseconds. So we're gonna go to sleep for 10, for 10 milliseconds. Then we wake up and start processing the next frame. This is what we wanna see, frame after frame after frame. We finish within budget and maybe a little bit left over to account for variance. This is what we don't wanna see. So in this example, still 50 millisecond frame budget, it took me 60 milliseconds to process that frame. Now I'm into the next frame. What am I gonna do here? I'm gonna have to drop that second frame. So all of my clients are not gonna receive an update for that frame. So let's think about what this looks like over time. The top scenario is what we wanna see. We want to see every single one of those frames consistently processed. Because when this happens, all of our players are going to have a very fluid, very consistent experience. That game is going to flow just like a movie that they're watching. That's what we want. In the bottom example, we're dropping frames pretty frequently. What that's going to result in is what we call rubber banding, stuttering. You're going to see skipping around in the game. And after maybe a few minutes of that, you're going to have some very unhappy players that are going to start logging tickets. Not good. So let's be a little bit more specific. What do we mean when we say consistent? For most games, we want to process those frames within budget at least 95% of the time, if not higher. So we need a very, very high level of consistency and a very low level of variance. So one of the things that I'm very excited to talk about today is our compute platform. Okay? Clouds are busy places. Running a game in the cloud is very different than running a game on a bare metal server. We have a hypervisor on that cloud scheduling resources that has overhead associated with it. And you have other tenants that are running processes on that same host. They may be running game servers also. Those two things can introduce significant variance into the performance that you're encountering on a game server. Okay? So up until today, we've had one type of virtual machine. If you've used GCP, you're very familiar with N1 standard virtual machines. They're really cool. We abstract all of the underlying hardware away. And what that means is I can go in there and dial in exactly how many vCPUs I want from 1 to 96. I can dial in exactly how much RAM I want. Very customizable, very flexible, but in order to accomplish that, very abstracted from the underlying hardware. Also, our N1 standards on Skylake, which is our newest, uh, our newest generation of, uh, of hardware up until today, runs at 2.7 gigahertz. That's our sustained clock speed across all cores. So today we're introducing an entirely new hardware platform called Compute Optimized VMs. And these are going to bump the clock speed up significantly to 3.8 gigahertz. And that's sustained across all, all cores. And we've also got some features in there that are going to reduce the variance that you're going to see even at that high clock speed. So let's dig in a little bit. So compared to our Skylakes running on N1s, you're going to see a 40% increase in performance on our compute-optimized VMs. What does that mean? Conceptually, that processing time in your main loop could decrease by 40%. You get a lot more room for error. You can also do a lot more within that same 50 milliseconds. We've also increased the speed of the network up to 32 gigabits per second 
Now I can think about connecting more players to my game server because I've got more clock cycles and I've got more throughput on the network. So that's high performance. Let's talk about variance. So I've illustrated a physical host here. This is sort of a conceptual version of what a host in the cloud looks like. We have very large CPUs, typically more than one socket running on a host. Those sockets are connected with an interconnect, and they each have a local RAM bus, right? In an N1 standard, that, that's all abstracted away from you. You just have a big bucket of cores and a big bucket of RAM, right? Let's say that you're running a game on the CPU on the left, and some of your RAM has been scheduled onto the RAM bank for the other socket. I'm going to have to reach across that interconnect to access my RAM, which is going to be a lot slower than if I were to access that same RAM locally. And I don't have any visibility or control into that on a standard VM. In a lot of cases, that's still fine for your game. But for cases that are very sensitive to performance with our compute-optimized VMs, we're exposing the underlying hardware platform, which is Cascade Lake. So now you'll be able to have transparency into the physical hardware that's running on the host. And we're also, accessing, uh, we're also exposing this topology. So now you have visibility into the NUMA topology of the host. So it gives you a lot more control over the workload that you're running. We also do some cool things like pinning your RAM to the local socket. So if you run the right size shape, you can effectively capture that socket, and your RAM will be pinned to that local RAM node. So some really cool stuff for gaming with compute-optimized VMs. Those go into alpha today. Um, I've got my uh, contact information on the last slide. And if you're interested in starting to test them, uh, reach out to me, and I'll help you get that set up. All right, let's talk about scaling up. So now we know what's needed to run a game server. We want to run a whole lot of game servers. So how do we scale a game server up for global audiences? So in the picture of the United States, you saw a few different GCP regions. Globally, we have 19 regions. We have four more coming. That'll be 23 regions. So those are different locations that you can place your virtual machines as close as possible to the gamers that will be connecting to them. So this picture might look like a, a lot like the picture that you see from other clouds, right? All clouds have regions. We all have zones. One of the fundamental differences between our cloud and other clouds is that all of our regions and all of our edge pops are connected together with our private fiber optic interconnect. So in other clouds, when you're transiting between data centers or between edge pops, you're going to be transiting the internet. So you're subject to the network topology of the internet. With Google Cloud, when you're transiting between data centers and from pop to data center, it's all on our private fiber. So I mentioned we have 19 regions. That's a pretty nice selection of locations to deploy your servers. If you look a little closer on this diagram, there's all these gray dots. Those are our edge pop locations. We have 134 edge pop locations, all with fiber interconnects back to our data centers. Game servers use public IPs. That's how our game clients out on the internet connect to them. When I spin up a virtual machine in GCP, that public IP is globally advertised at all 134 of those edge pops. So when your client goes to connect to the region that's closest to him, he's actually going to connect to the edge pop that's even closer. And then he's going to transit the fiber into our data center. So this is how we're going to get you as close as possible to your gamers and give you the lowest possible latency into those locations. OK, so let's talk about scaling. Now that we understand we have a global private fiber optic network to run our games on, only with GCP, let's think about how we're going to scale up on that network. And we've got three different options. I mentioned earlier that Google is all about open. We love choice. So we have three different ways that you can run your game servers in our cloud. 
You can build the scaling infrastructure yourself, and some of you have already. We have an awesome managed partner that you can work with to help you run your game servers. And you can look into using Kubernetes and containers and leveraging the power of Kubernetes to scale. So let's talk about these three options. So let's start with building it ourselves. So let's say that we want to deploy our game server into three different zones. We're going to use the basic fundamental building blocks of Google Cloud. We're going to use virtual machines and the APIs associated with them. And to scale the collection of virtual machines up and down, we're going to use managed instance groups, which will create new virtual machines for us very easily. So in each zone, we'll have a collection of VMs and a managed instance group to scale up and down. So that's the GCP infrastructure that we're going to use. We're also going to need some additional infrastructure that we're going to have to build, which is typically called a server manager or an autoscaler. And that piece of software is going to be responsible for calling out to the appropriate managed instance groups and VMs and scaling them up and down. Well, that sounds pretty easy. You know, I don't have to depend on anyone else. This actually turns out to be a pretty complex piece of software to write. And in order to understand why it's complex, we need to look at how game servers are deployed. But generally speaking, we're going to recommend this option for those that have already written this piece of software and for their own bare metal environments for another cloud and simply would need to retrofit it to use our managed instance groups and VMs. So let's look at what game servers look like when they're deployed, right? Do we just spin up a whole bunch of VMs for each one of these game servers? Typically not. A game server is a pretty lightweight process. It's typically single-threaded. For that reason, it typically only needs a single core, maybe two cores. And so there's too much overhead in spinning up a virtual machine for one vCPU. So what's commonly done, even on bare metal, is you bring up a larger host, and then you bin pack a bunch of processes onto that host, utilizing however many cores your particular game server needs. So in this example, I've got an N1 standard 16, 16 vCPUs, and I've got about, about 16 game server processes running on that single virtual machine. So when you're thinking about scaling up and scaling down, you're not only spinning up virtual machines, but you have to worry about all that bin packing. You have to think about how to drain that host as matches come to a close. So there's a lot of life cycle that needs to be built into your server manager, not to mention error handling. But for shops that have built their own logic, this can be a great route to go. We're actually very excited that the Division 2 uh, is running with this methodology on GCP. So that game launched on GCP uh, very recently. We're very excited uh, that they're running at scale in our cloud using this methodology. And what Massive really loved about working with Google is that we understand games. We're gamers. We love digging in and helping companies scale their games up in our cloud. So that's the build-it-yourself model. And you can scale games way up if you're willing to invest in that infrastructure. Let's talk about the managed partner option. Maybe you don't want to invest all that time in building your own scaling infrastructure. And instead, you'd prefer to enlist the expertise of a partner who's a professional running game servers, who can provide 24-7, 365 service who can run your game servers not only in cloud, but also in a collection of bare metal colos located globally. A partner who has 20 years of experience running game servers. We're very excited to work with Multiplay as our game server hosting partner. And they can provide a managed partner level of service to you. And we're even more excited to talk about Apex Legends, which uses the multiplay service on GCP to scale up for a global audience. Some of these numbers are pretty incredible. So Apex Legends scaled up to a million players in eight hours. Think about that for a minute. That number seems incredible, but then think about the fact that it scaled up to 10 million players in three days. And then, 
multiplied that number by five and scaled up to 50 million players in only four weeks. This is exactly the kind of outcome that you want for your game. And this is why you would work with a partner like Multiplay and run your, your game on a global cloud like GCP. If you read any of the press around the Apex Legends launch, it was really positive about how smooth the experience was for the players. This game just went from zero to millions without a hitch. And that's because of that combination of Multiplay and GCP scalability. So this is a very exciting use case. So then let's talk about the third option for scaling game servers. The third option is leveraging the power of Kubernetes. So when you think back to that diagram that I drew earlier, virtual machine with a bunch of processes bin packed onto it, that sounds an awful lot like a Kubernetes node with a bunch of containers bin packed onto it. Kubernetes is really, really good at doing that. However, Kubernetes doesn't understand game servers. Kubernetes is designed for stateless workloads. It's designed for HTTP workloads. So we built an extension to Kubernetes called a Gonase with Ubisoft that teaches Kubernetes about game servers. It teaches Kubernetes how to handle UDP endpoints. It teaches Kubernetes about game server lifecycle so that Kubernetes doesn't decide to scale down your game servers in the middle of a match. So with Agonase, we're building an open API to run and scale your games with Kubernetes in an environment of your choosing. And in the same way that we approached Kubernetes and GKE, we're working on a managed service for Agonase as well that we'd love to talk to you about. So we're excited that SuperSolid has chosen to launch their new game, Snake Rivals. This will be the first production game on Agonase. And we're, uh, we're, we're just thrilled to have this game launching on Agonase. We're working with many other studios uh, on non-production games uh, for Agonase. So you have sort of these three different choices, and you can choose which of these is the best fit for your team and for your game. And in any of these three, you're going to know that you've got Google's infrastructure powering your game behind the scenes. So let's talk about the future of cloud gaming, this thing called Stadia. So our client and server discussion will come in handy here. Stadia is a new kind of gaming platform. It brings high fidelity AAA games to any screen that can run Chrome. It does that by moving that game client that we talked about earlier with its GPU into the cloud, rendering the content in a cloud data center, and then streaming that content as if it was a video to a, cl a, cl to a Chrome screen. So in a sense, if we've moved the game server into the cloud with GCP, we've moved the game client into the cloud with Stadio. So let's talk about what that private fiber optic network does for us with Stadia. 10 to 25 milliseconds to our clients sounded pretty good without Stadia. Now our clients are running on the same fiber optic network that our servers are running on. So think about what that does to your average latency to your clients and what kinds of possibilities that opens up for new types of games and new types of interactions that haven't been possible when your game's clients were distributed on the internet. Now we mentioned that Google is, an, is open. You can still run your game servers in a colo or in another cloud, and it'll work with Stadia, but you're gonna be back to that old latency model where you're transiting the internet, 10 to 25 milliseconds. So we're really excited about the new types of games that people will build when the entire game infrastructure is on the same private fiber optic network. So here's a bit more of a detailed view of what the architecture would look like. So the only thing that's out on the internet now is your Chrome device. Your game client has been moved into one of those edge pops that I showed earlier in our network diagram. 
so it's even closer to your players than the game server is. But it's communicating with your game servers over that private fiber that you saw earlier. Here's the same picture if you're running your game servers in another cloud or in a colo. You're still going to get great performance, but you're not going to get that same level of low latency that you're going to get with everything running on the same network. So what, what does Stadia and GCP do together? Security. All of your network traffic now is on a private fiber optic network, except for the streaming, the streaming data going back to your clients. Performance, we've already talked about. Let's talk a little bit about egress. One of the significant costs of running game servers can be egress. If I'm sending updates to hundreds of players, tens or hundreds of times a second, that generates a lot of egress. You have to pay for egress in the cloud. When your egress is going from GCP to Stadia, we've worked out a significant discount on the egress. So it'll be actually less expensive to run your game servers in GCP if they're interacting with Stadia. So we're really excited about this combination. We're excited about the new types of games that you'll build. And we're very excited to work with you to scale those games up in the cloud. So would love your feedback on the session. Um, my contact information is at the bottom of the screen. Uh, feel free to email me. Uh, or reach out to me on Twitter or LinkedIn. If you're interested in those compute-optimized VMs, let me know. I'll help you get whitelisted. Uh, we think they're going to be pretty awesome. We've gotten some early feedback from a major AAA studio, and they're very, very excited about the performance that they're seeing in their early testing. <laughs>